but I'm going to be reading prose tonight, and that's because this book is written in prose. It's being called a memoir, but there is a third character. The two main characters are myself and my husband, uh, the writer, Patrick Lane, and our 40 years together. Um, but the third character is really poetry um, because we met as poets. And when he died, he left behind a manuscript of poetry for me to edit. So I feel that his poetry is continuing. It's how we got together and it's how we came to an end. And the other characters in the book are the five cats who shared our lives with us. So I've never, um, in the readings I've been giving, I haven't started at the beginning before. I'm going to begin at the beginning and then I'm going to do a little bit of skipping ahead. Because poetry is a character in the book, many poems appear. And I, I thought that was appropriate because uh, in all of uh, my books of poetry that I've been writing for almost 50 years now, some of them are autobiographical and they have brought in what Patrick and I have gone through together and our garden. So intuitively, I would slip in a poem whenever it felt like the right occasion to do so. So you'll hear a few poems too, as they appear in this reading. I should check the time here. Okay. February 2017. Spring comes early to Vancouver Island. It's still a surprise, though it's been 27 years since we moved to the rain coast. There are many advantages to this temperate climate, some not as obvious as the early return of the male robins or the snowdrops whitening the borders of our front lawn instead of real snow. If we have to euthanize our cat and bury him, the ground will not be frozen eight feet down as it is until late April in Saskatchewan, where I was born. We'll dig and the winter earth will give. It will open up to take his tawny, long-haired, skinny, beloved body. This is some comfort, I guess. The naming of cats is a difficult matter, claimed T.S. Eliot. For all of his brilliance and his affection for his feline companions, perhaps he didn't know that cats love to carry the names of poets into the world. Eighteen years ago, when we chose from the litter this male who looked like a small blue-eyed cloud, we named him Basho after the Japanese haiku master. Like his namesake, our Basho practices karumi, a lightness on his paws and a lightness in his spirit that lets him greet the world as it is, whether he's feeling well or out of sorts, whether he's decided to walk alone or in our company. The choice is his. This morning, he's chosen to doze close to where I'm weeding, curled like a worn, tossed away rug on the newly stirring earth, letting the days go on with their business as he dreams what cats dream when they are old. Baudelaire said that you can tell the time by looking in the eyes of a cat. Basho's time is running out. He's been diagnosed with kidney failure. We have to give him intravenous water and vitamin shots twice a week. I also rub an ointment on the inside of his ear to titillate his appetite. Even so, I stalk him in the house several times a day with a bowl of food I hope will spark his hunger. Too often, he turns his head away with elegant disdain, thinking, about the world without him makes me panic. My breath catches in my chest like a broken flying thing. Trowel in hand, I pause to look at him, to memorize the two skinny strokes of charcoal smudged from the outer corner of each eye to the top of his mocha-colored head to note again the exact place where his ear is notched, the fringes of his long coat, the length and texture of the thick tufts between his toes, as if he was born to walk on snow, the bump of a scar on his dark nose from a long ago spat. 
I could sit with him here for hours as he curls in sleep, basking in the calmness that he breathes into the world. But the garden doesn't slow down, doesn't wait for me to catch up. It's not only snowdrops that are flourishing. The back end of our property, around two thirds of an acre on the north end of the Saanich Peninsula on this far western island, has sprung alive with unwanted green. And if I want to stop it spreading, I have to get at it. That's okay. Pulling out the first blurts of February fecundity is one of the few things I have control of. It is good physical labor whose results are immediately obvious to even an amateur gardener's eye. In Moonlight, something moves just beyond the mind's clumsy fingers. It has to do with seeds, the earth's insomnia, the garden going on without us, needing no one to watch it, not even the moon. Patrick, the man I've been living with for almost 40 years, is in the garden too. It's a treat to have him home. He spent the last three weeks in the hospital with a high fever, chills, and sweats. It was an emergency admittance. His doctor, one of the internal medicine hotshots in the acute care clinic at the Victoria General Hospital, took one look at him and said, you're staying here. Several months before Patrick's first hospital stay, pain began an assault on his body, occupying one zone, then moving relentlessly to another. One morning, his neck and shoulder stiffened and his upper body froze. We attributed this rigidity to the hours he'd spent hunched over the computer working on his new novel. He was in no shape to teach, but a year ago he'd signed up to lead a three-day workshop at a retreat center about two hours away. I had to pull some stuff together, rush off and fill in. Many of those registered had flown from other provinces to work with him and he couldn't just cancel. By the time I got back home, the rigor had disappeared, but he felt as if a metal wire was being yanked tight around his forehead, the ache so unbearable, our family doctor thought he had a brain bleed and sent him for a scan. Then his right leg ballooned and reddened from knee to ankle, and I couldn't touch him anywhere. His skin was too tender. He lost his appetite. He was breathless. He couldn't sleep. Not his heart, but the bones that caged his heart smarted when he woke up. There were nights he spiked a fever and his side of the bed was soaked by morning. The markers in his blood that indicated a serious infection regularly went off the chart. He was released from the hospital after three weeks of intravenous antibiotics and tests, including a search for a, search for a cardiac infection. Not one of the seven specialists who pinched and prodded and asked long lists of questions proffered a diagnosis. What he has is some kind of autoimmune disorder, but the big names they throw at him, giant cell arteritis, polymyalgia rheumatica, vasculitis, don't stick. His symptoms jump the borders of the doctor's expertise. Once they ruled out problems with his heart, they tested for tumors, for Lyme disease, for bone marrow cancer, for tropical infections he might have picked up years ago in South America, and finally for strange syndromes we've never heard of, including something called Whipple disease. When the technician took vials of blood for this rare condition, she asked, have you been in any Nordic countries? Have you been around sheep? The man who has never complained about the state of his health keeps saying that something isn't right, that he feels sick deep inside. You're a mystery, Mr. Lane, his practitioners say one by one. It's the last thing a patient wants to hear. They load him up with antibiotics, painkillers, and prednisone, a high-powered steroid that doesn't get rid of the underlying cause, but props him up with a cardboard crutch until a diagnosis and treatment can be found. 
if they can be found. All we know for sure is that he is ill and his illness is devastating to us both. Patrick steps down off the deck to trim the plumes of yellow and red grasses he planted last fall along the shores of a dry stream we laid stone by stone outside his office window after we cut down two huge laurels that blocked his view. I try not to watch him. He works only 10 minutes or so before he stops, stands upright, and musters the strength to boost himself onto the deck again. It rises only a foot above the ground, but he strains to lift his legs one and then the other as if they've morphed into tree stumps. It's hard for him to keep his balance. A fall could be catastrophic. The unforgiving drugs have eaten away at his bones, and if they break, they may not mend. Last July, sitting inside at my desk on the other side of a sliding glass door that faces the backyard, I watched three baby raccoons attempt the same task as Patrick. They'd been hiding, not nesting, I'd hoped, in the darkness under the deck. They tried to heave themselves from the stone stream, first by placing their front paws on the edge of the planks, then struggling to hoist their chubby haunches. The biggest of the three did it with no trouble, swinging up his left back leg, then his right. His siblings had as much difficulty as Patrick, more really because they did fall, tumbling backwards, then righting themselves and trying again. I could hear the mother chittering encouragement, though I couldn't see her. After three tries, the second kit hauled himself up and scuffled towards her in that hunchbacked, perambulatory style particular to their kind. Because of the oxymoronic way raccoons move, lumbering and graceful, galumphing and lissom, you'd guess they shared ancestors with both the bear and the weasel. Patrick described them perfectly, a ballerina with a wrestler's shoulders. The runt looked like it wasn't going to make it. What if I interfered and gave it a boost with my foot? The nature of these animals made me pause. Their sweet looking faces belie their fierceness. Their claws are serious weapons. Throw a raccoon into an action movie and it would win against any kenjutsu. Their deft fingers are usually employed in more peaceful, though annoying to a gardener, tasks like plucking water hyacinths from the pond or flipping over the moss and our carefully arranged stones to look for grubs. Raccoon comes to English from the Algonquin word arakum. Its translation, he who scratches with his hand highlights the nimbleness of the animal's forepaws. It's easy to imagine him doing more creative things with his long, spreadable fingers. Game. By the pond at night, three raccoons play paper, scissors, rock. They have the hands to do it. When they get bored, they turn ahead the clocks while you lie sleeping. That's why, no matter what your age, by dawn, your time is up. Ours has been a public love story, Patrick's and mine, shared in poems and books and in interviews on CBC. In the national press, we've been called one of Canada's powerhouse literary couples, and we've talked openly about what it's like for two writers to live together. My written words are inextricably linked to his. Our offices, converted from bedrooms in the house where we've lived since 2006, sit side by side. I can roll back my chair, lean out my study door, and see his back as he sits at his computer. Frequently, one of us will raise their voice only slightly and ask, how do you spell? Before we send anything out or give a talk, we ask the other to edit what we've done, and each of us is merciless, our pens slashing across the page. 
because we respect each other, when it's necessary, we dare to say, this isn't good enough. You have to start over. We're critical, even of the poems we dedicate for Patrick or for Lorna. When he passes me a piece of paper with words I know are meant for me, I ask, do you want me to just enjoy this or edit it? Enjoy, he says, and I do, I do, and he does too. I can't help but think that a passage from Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway could have had us in mind. He thought her beautiful, believed her impeccably wise, dreamed of her, wrote poems to her, which, ignoring the subject, she corrected in red ink. When we ran off together in 1978, abandoning our marriages and leaving wreckage in our wake, I was a promising writer. Patrick had just won the Governor General's Award. I was so happy for him, and I've continued to be every time an honor comes his way. But I knew if I didn't grow, if I remained merely someone who showed potential, we wouldn't last. I swore I wouldn't play the dutiful wife, cheerleader, and muse of the great male writer, and he didn't envision a partner like that. I didn't want to grow pale and bitter in his shadow or be worn thin by professional jealousy. We aspire to flourish together and thrive in words and books and gardens. Mary Pratt, whose pictures and interviews I turn to for inspiration and guidance, has fearlessly documented the difficulties of living with the revered male artist who works in the same field. When Christopher Pratt's reputation shone brighter than hers near the beginning of their careers, she sought counsel for one of her former university teachers and mentors, Lauren Harris, the son of the group of seven luminary he was named after. Harris told her that there was room for only one painter per household, and at the Pratt's, that wasn't her. I can't help but think of the courage and self-confidence she had to rally to ignore that advice from someone who praised her early work. Though she was born 13 years before me, the world hadn't changed that much by the time Patrick and I moved in together. I needed to find the same belief in myself that she was able to muster and hold on to it no matter what accolades or harsh counsel came his or my way. In our years together, there's been the odd flicker of jealousy from each of us, but we've survived our sometimes less than admirable feelings. Yes, we are only humans, I say to myself, because we don't let them hang around for long. Like grains of dust, Envy, competitiveness, and self-pity blow through the screen door of the back porch where we get at them with a broom and sweep them out before they can sift into the inner rooms that provide a haven for our hours in each other's company. Our unwavering support of one another's decision to live our lives as poets, however risky and fraught, and our genuine pleasure in each other's success these characterize, above all else, the 40 years we've spent side by side, dreaming our words into the world. It is a strange obsession to have, this passion for poetry, and surely it demands a pledge to love and support the one who balances beside you on a line of words stretched thin as hope over an abyss of self-doubt and fear and probable obscurity. And this is towards the end of the book. We hear on the radio that this has been the biggest snowfall on Vancouver Island in a hundred years. And unlike other harsh winters, the snow is hanging around. It's deep and compressed enough by its own weight for a chunky raccoon to saunter across its hardened surface from the door of my study around the back of the yard to the tree in front of the kitchen. 
He climbs it easily and glances at me over his shoulder as if I don't matter. He agilely jumps to the railing where the wisteria by the end of April will pump out blossoms and fill the air with their distinctive mauve perfume. Patrick has been three months out of the hospital. He tells me no matter what, he'll not go back. We sit on the couch in the living room in the early morning and watch the shrubs and trees in the front yard and the big conifers across the road pull themselves into visibility, into the soft gaze of the dawn. Because of all the snow out of place here, the world outside our window is blue, the blue of my childhood, as if high above the trees, a glass bottle of India ink has been tipped into the light. The darkness disappears slowly. Though I worry about what will happen next, about how many weeks we'll have before another crisis, I choose, hour by hour, to live with hope rather than despair, with closeness rather than distance, with the belief that if I don't risk everything, the days will be dry and shrunken. If I don't give myself over time and time again to love, I will not be worthy of the small space and span I've been allotted on this cherished patch of earth with my charming, brilliant, beloved husband. 40 years. One man, one woman, five cats. This adds up to a life, a palmful of time, a plenitude, a significance. And I'll conclude with the poem that opens the book. Pardon my raspy voice tonight. Poem me. I came to him that first night and said, poem me, and he did. He came to me that first night and said, poem me, and I did. Of our hours, we made a poem. Of our years, we made a poem. Many things happened in between. Many things were rubbed out, repeated, neglected, ignored, stained, thrown away. But this morning, he said, poem me. This morning, I said, poem me. And we made of our lives a poem. Thank you. So oh, heartbreaking. So beautiful. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Well, thank you, Lorna. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I thought, oh, good, she's going to read a poem. I'll have time to pull myself together before. <laughs> and then the poem just made me cry more. <laughs> that was really moving. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it.